I want to make the most of our time, and so I want to jump right into it. If this is your first time here, no sweat at all. Uh, we're all getting well from something. Come on. We're all getting well from something. I don't know your pain, and you don't need to know mine. What we need to know is the answer to our pain, and that is Jesus. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter the struggles you face, no matter the challenges that have been afflicted or inflicted upon you, no matter the hurt that has that you have caused or has been thrusted in your life. We're all trying to get better from something. We're all trying to get well from something. So don't let the person that you saw during worship fool you with their exuberant praise and their uh, consistent smile. They've got issues too. So the fact that they had issues but their hands were raised and they were in a spirit of praise, that doesn't make their worship less authentic. It makes it more meaningful that they were once where they were, but look what the Lord has done. He must have good plans for me. And so we're all trying to get better from something. And I said that just to say this, no matter where you've been in life, there's no judgment here because we all are in need of the grace and the mercy of God. And we find it together at the foot of the cross. Somebody shout good plans. As we read about the earthly ministry of Jesus through the four gospels, these would be the four eyewitness accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus we discover those through the books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. And what I appreciate about these four books is that they are snapshots of not just what Jesus taught, but the miracles Jesus performed. And matter of fact, these are just snapshots because the book of John comes on and says, if I were to list all the signs and wonders that we have seen Jesus perform, there's not enough books or volumes in all the libraries and all the world throughout all of time to contain or record all that Jesus has done. In other words, Jesus has done, is doing, and wants to do more than you can possibly see or even imagine or record. So what we're going to see today is just a snapshot of what God is doing. I wonder what God is doing in your life that you have ignored because it wasn't as monumental as you thought it should be. I wonder what miracles he's been performing in your life that you've overlooked just because the miracle didn't show up, ring the doorbell, and announce itself as miraculous. Uh, I bet he's doing something. I bet he is. And as we read these earthly accounts of Jesus' ministry, what 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 struck me the other day upon reading through them is how many of these miraculous signs and wonders were performed on what we would call an ordinary day. Jesus was going from one town to the next, from one moment teaching the disciples to the next moment teaching the crowd, and on his way from point A to point B, miracles burst out. Ordinary days. Maybe in that sense, there is no such thing as an ordinary day. In that sense, no wonder uh, the Bible says, rejoice for today is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice in it. In what? In the day. What's in the day? Jesus is in the day. And if Jesus is in the day, then miracles can abound. That's why Monday is not mundane. Monday is reserved for the miraculous. Maybe he's a way maker even on Mondays. Maybe you can testify about something on Tuesday. Maybe on Wednesday, he's still at work. On Thursday... I can't think of anything that rhymes with Thursday, but you get the point. You get the point. There's no such thing as an ordinary day when Jesus is in it. But on an ordinary day, Jesus just finished uh, preaching what we would call uh, in seminary or in the church world, the Sermon on the Mount. We call it the Sermon on the Mount because he preached a sermon on the side of a mountain. Very creative, right? And Jesus is teaching this what I would call a, a, a confetti message. Confetti because there was one blast, it happened in one setting, but when you dissect the text, it was, it was, it was this array of, 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 of colorful, potent truths of heaven. Like one message, but he's all over the place. Like he's got over 16 different topics he talks about and over 32 sub points within the 16 topics that he just broke in one setting. Can you imagine this? How do you take notes on somebody like that? I mean, this is an entire seminary lecture in one setting. How long was it? I don't know. 
I can't imagine, but I know the people got hungry and it was time to leave. Jesus is preaching one message and he's all over the place. He's talking about judgment. He's talking about Jewish customs. He's talking about oaths. He's talking about attitudes. He's talking about divorce. He's talking about wisdom. He's talking about prayer. He's talking about ask, seek, knock, and it will be open. He's talking about all these different topics and subjects and subpoints in one setting. And I love it. I love it because somebody gave the preacher time to just say what he wants to say. <laughs> I love it. I love it. But beside that point, it's almost as if Jesus understood it's his job to deliver the message, and it's the job of the people to receive what they need. Can I break that down? Almost like this. You've never seen your UPS driver, FedEx driver, United States Postal Service representative, or your Amazon delivery uh, person sit on your front porch and wait for you to get home and personally hand you the package and then stand there waiting for you to open it up and then receive the gift that was inside. You've never seen them do that. No, no, no. They do the dump and run method. You know what I'm talking about. They dump it, snap a picture of it, and they gone. They gone. Because they know their assignment. Their assignment is to deliver the package, not make sure you open and receive the gift that's inside. Jesus spends his moments um, here with the crowd delivering the message of hope, the message of wisdom, the message of God's sovereignty, the message of God's love and redemption and care and mercy and compassion and passion for heaven. And perhaps it wasn't just to spark in educational, intellectual, deep dive into theological matters. Maybe he understood that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of the Lord. And so there's something about what we're doing right now, hearing the message of God that is doing more than just feeding your curiosity of your mind about spiritual matters. It's building your faith to believe God, that God is still a God who does miracles. And so if you're in need of a miracle then perhaps today is not an ordinary day after all. Matthew chapter 8. When Jesus came down from that mountainside, large crowds followed him, and a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, time out. Let's interrupt the text and just superimpose a word that is not in the text, but I could argue that it should be in the text, especially when you understand Jewish culture and the customs of the day. The word's not in the text, but it should be superimposed in the text. Uh, the word suddenly. It should read, large crowds followed Jesus and a man with leprosy suddenly came and knelt before Jesus. I say suddenly because... How does a man with leprosy sneak up on Jesus? This is like a sneak attack for a healing. He's trying to pickpocket a healing from Jesus. Because if you understand the Jewish culture and the law of the day, a person with leprosy, the skin-eating disease, it just ravishes the body um, of its health and is very infectious and contagious. By Jewish law, a man with leprosy must stand from a distance at least 50 feet away from anyone else and announce his infection. Unclean. Unclean. Stay away. If you're taking notes, write this down. Be warned. Be warned. I know I look good from a distance, but up close, I'm devastated. You can just see what I'm allowing you to see from a distance, but when you get up close, you see my infirmities. I look good from 50 feet away. You can't discern or dissect what's wrong with me, but up close, I've got a disease. Watch this. I'm talking about the man's infirmities, but let's be honest. We've all got spots. We've got brokenness. We've been betrayed, we've been hurt, we've been let down, we're carrying a cloak of shame, resentment, regret. The man has a physical infirmity, but we're all carrying some level of dysfunction in our life. He's supposed to announce, unclean, 
But something about this man understands if he would announce his infirmity in front of the masses, he's taking a great chance or gamble that they will either take Jesus and run away or they will arrest him and whisk him away. That is a chance he cannot afford to take. And so he just goes straight to the source of his healing and says, Jesus, I need a miracle. And he goes to Jesus. He can't take the chance that the crowd will discourage him, persuade him, silence him, or, or resurrect his doubt. So this is not a time to be politely, politically correct. This is not a time to take a consensus of old friends. What do you think I should do? No, he understands I need a healing, and there is a miracle worker right before me. Just let me speak to Jesus. He goes to Jesus And so watch this, a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. Wait a second. So this man broke protocol to get to Jesus. Jesus honors the man's faith and he breaks protocol and touches the man. Aren't you grateful to know that we have a God who's willing to touch what other people spend their life avoiding? That we have a God who is so great with mercy and compassion and tenderness and empathy and care and concern. He's willing to get to the ugly places of our life. What other people have have ran from and shamed you because of. What other people keep posting about and reminding you about. Jesus doesn't talk about your shame. He calls you by name and he's willing to get down and touch the very place that's causing you so much grief and agony in your life. He's not just a miracle working God. He's a personal God. Come on, somebody say, he ain't scared. (laughs) He's, He's not scared. I love Jesus' response here. The man says, if you are willing, and Jesus responds with three words, but the first two words are the most important words. Jesus says, I am willing. I am willing. When Moses in the Old Testament asked God, what is your name? God responded, I am that I am. Well, God, what does that even mean? (laughs) I am too great for you to even understand. My ways are higher than your ways. Uh, My wisdom, you can understand if I would draw you a diagram and put it um, in front of an Egyptian PowerPoint presentation, right? My wisdom is too lofty for you. My power is too great for you to confine or understand. I am who I am. You fill in the blank of what you need. And I'm greater, I'm stronger, I'm wiser, I'm more loving and caring than you can possibly imagine. But I love the fact that he's not just I am that I am. He also has a personal empathetic care and concern for his people. I am willing. I am willing. I am willing, he said, be healed. See, the man was shouting, be warned. I've got issues. And Jesus says, be healed. I am. Be warned. Stay at bay. Jesus says, I am. Come close. (laughs) I am, he said, be healed. Immediately, he was healed of his leprosy. And skin that forgot what it was like to be healthy just knew what to do. In the same way, when Jesus spoke the world into existence and he said, let there be light, light that never existed automatically knew how to shine. When Jesus said, let there be water, water that never existed just knew how to flow and be wet. In the same way, you have forgotten what it's like to be healthy in some areas of your life. You forgot what it was like to have a happy home. You you forgot what it was like to be free from that addiction. You forgot what it was like to be a person of peace. You forgot what it was like to be at rest and contentment in your relationships. You forgot what it was like to go through life without that particular pain issue in your life. In a moment's notice, Jesus can say, be healed. And everything that forgot what it was like to ever exist can come together. Um, It can come together and be restored at a moment's notice. Why? I am who I am. Watch this now. 
Immediately he was healed from his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anybody, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded, just talking about in Old Testament law, as a testimony to them. Can I uh, just give you three applicational points today? Three applicational points today. Everybody say, sure, pastor, go ahead. You're going to do it anyways. Why are you even asking? It doesn't matter. Uh, And uh, watch this, number one, number one, number one. His presence can handle your pain. His presence, the presence of God can handle your pain. The reason why I bring that up is because more often than not, I run into people who say, well, I can't go to Jesus about this particular issue. I've had it too long. Or, or, you know, I know this area of my life is probably wrong, but to be honest, pastor, I still enjoy it. And so we're scared to come to Jesus because we're scared that Jesus is either going to reject us or we're going to be disappointed with the outcome. And Jesus is okay with your pollution. He loves you with your pollution. He wants wants you to walk with him so that he can help you rid the pollution. Now, Jesus doesn't like the pollution. He loves you. So he's okay with you approaching him with everything that is on you as long as you're willing to allow him to get the pollution off you. You following me? Some of you, you're hoping for a miracle, but what you're carrying is keeping you at bay. You want to clean yourself up before you allow yourself to be caught. And Jesus says, I'll take you just the way you are, and you walk with me, and I'll begin to heal you from the inside out. Well, who do you think you are? I am who I am. Some of you grew up in an environment where every time you made a mistake, every time you had a setback, every time you uh, committed a sin, against a family value or something like that in your home, the issue was never fully resolved until a parental figure or a person of authority punished you physically or emotionally. And so now you have brought that into the spirit world where the issue isn't resolved until you suffer enough. Well, I've not suffered enough. That's why we reject his grace and his mercy because it seems too simple because we know what we deserve. And God says, I'll accept the punishment. I'll send my one and only son on a cross and die for you so that the guilty can be pardoned and go free. Can I really break it down? Here's what we think. Here's here's how we think this works. If I can have my daughter come up here to the stage real fast. Avery, Avery, come over here. Come over here. Hey, girl, I'll see you with a leather jacket. Hey, girl. <laughs> watch this. Watch this. Let the people see your beautiful face, darling. You stand right here. You stand right here. Here's the way we picture God working. Every turn around, turn around. Face that way. Face your mama. <laughs> um, we talked about this last week. The word repentance simply means about face. It means a change in direction and perspective. I was once... Uh, I was once walking away from God, but I repented. I turned and I began to face Jesus and pursue Jesus. Here's what we think, that God calls us into repentance every turn around. And now he expects these massive leaps and bounds of, of faith muscles to exist before we think we're worthy for him to touch our life. So, so there better be a massive Commitment to prayer every day. Take a big step towards me. Yeah, 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 yeah. And a massive leap and bound in terms of worship and devotion and consistency. Take another step. Yeah, massive amount. And then this massive amount of just, of just this extra grace and patience. Yeah, 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 yeah. And as soon as we have a miss up, a mishap or a setback, we got to go all the way back to the very beginning and start all over again. But once I can be consistent, then... I can receive his grace and mercy. But that's not the way it works, is it? That's not the way it works. Can I show you what it looks like? Avery, turn around. Avery, because God always calls us by our name, not our shame. Avery, this is your daddy, and I love you. And I know you're going through something right now, and I know you feel like you don't deserve grace and mercy. But Avery, repent. Turn around. You see this? <laughs> the moment you begin the turn, he's already there. 
Watch this. The man found his healing not because he was protecting his pain and pollution, but because he went to Jesus with it. Yeah. Follow me on this? Yeah. There's healing in the presence of Jesus. Thank you, babe. Watch this. Number two, write this down. The Lord is willing. So number one, his presence can handle your pain. And number two, the Lord is willing to heal you. Jesus said, I am willing. Notice the present tense of the text. It's not, well, I was, but you missed your moment. I will be once you, perhaps if. He just said, I'm willing. Which tells me Jesus was willing to heal the infirmities of the man, before the man, with the man, after the man, and to every man, woman, and child that would call upon the name of the Lord. The Lord is willing. Point number three. If you go back to verse two, it says, don't tell anyone. But then when you read the gospel account according to Mark, Mark tells the same story as Matthew's telling us, but he adds on a detail Matthew didn't add. So whereas Matthew goes on to the next story, Mark followed the man. Mark studied the man. Mark continues to investigate what the man does. And Mark tells us what he did. Are you ready for this? Remember, Jesus said, don't tell nobody. Mark 1, 45. Instead, the man went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. Point number three, you can't mute a miracle. Ah, uh, when God does something, you can't mute a miracle. You can't keep it, keep it to yourself. When God does the supernatural, it can't remain a secret. <laughs> so watch this. God says, hey, um, that's between me and you. Don't tell nobody. And the man says, don't tell anybody? God says, don't tell anybody. Anybody, anybody? Anybody. Anybody. He says, anybody. Okay, Jesus. And the man was like, but I'm healed. He set me free from my infirmities. Look what the Lord has done. Ha <laughs> ha, look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me. It was just in time. I know, but I'm going to praise his name. Each day is just the same. Boom, boom, boom. I'm going to praise him. Look what the Lord has done. Why? Because you can't keep a miraculous moment to yourself. Miraculous moments were meant to be shared. The greatest sermons ever preached will not come from me. They will come from you, sharing your story of how a person that was bound from hell, walking away from Jesus, simply turned, and Jesus was waiting on them. And there was a supernatural embrace that cleansed us from the inside out. And that's what water baptism is all about. It is the miraculous moment being celebrated. Look what the Lord has done. So around here we go bananas and we celebrate because it's the greatest miracle of all time. Every other miracle, physical, financial, emotional, or mental, still ends when this life ends. But when God heals our soul and our spirit, that is the miracle that will live for all, uh, throughout all of time and eternity. It saves us from the grips of hell and he saves us with his grace and his mercy. And then now we're bound for heaven. And in the meantime, we just keep hugging Jesus.